It's personal eschatology. What, what happens when you die? So, anyway, let's, let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Uh, thank you for your presence here. Uh, guide and direct us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want to thank all of you who came up to the North Shore this past Sunday. Um, a lot of our people just, just were so uh, glad you came up. Uh, many of them got to know you guys, um, and many of them, I, I think it, it really showed to them what, what this school is all about, and um, uh, one guy was, was really quite impressed, and you'll be he probably hearing more about that later, so anyway, just want to thank you. You guys did a great job. Uh, Nick and Seth, he did a great, great job preaching, so, and the singers, Everyone was impressed with you three gals that sang Amazing Grace. Two gals. Two gals. Oh, you just played? played? Okay. Well, you played and two sang. All right. Well, the three of you did a great job. The, all you music, musicians and all you other ones who were there and swept up and did all that kind of stuff was good, too. So thanks for coming up. All right. Today we're going to talk about uh, what happens when we die or often called the intermediate stage, or state. <clears throat> Not the state of Hawaii, the intermediate state. Um, so you could take notes on this sheet if you want, or you can just listen, or you can take a nap if you're too tired. Um, just realize if you fall asleep, when you, in, in this class, you're in an intermediate state. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, anyway, if uh, in your notes, you'll notice um, I kind of divide this up into Old Testament, New Testament. Um, we'll be looking at a number of different passages. Uh, in a lot of your Bibles, You'll read in the English, you'll read words in the Old Testament that may be English word like hell. But what we think of hell, what we think of as the lake of fire is not ever mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, but the, the word that is used very often in the Old Testament and is often confused with hell is uh, this word, Sheol, some of you probably know it. And in some English versions, it's translated uh, the grave, or it's translated um, by even the word hell. But, but hell is such a loaded word. And um, um, if I have another opportunity, I'm, I'll probably talk about um, actually... I, I won't be looking at, at the actual events of the end times as much as talking about uh, the judgment seat of Christ and, and hell and heaven. So sometimes it's translated hell. Some of your newer versions, English versions, will just use this word, Sheol. And Sheol is a very, uh, very specific word. Uh, you'll notice a couple of uh, scripture passages here. Um, if somebody would like to look up first, or 2 Samuel 12, 22 through 23, go ahead. And then Psalm 89, 48, who'd like to look that up? Anybody? Okay. Psalm uh, 89, 48. Uh, Job 7, 9 through 10. Okay, thank you. And then Ecclesiastes 9 through 10. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll look at some of those verses. The word Sheol occurs 35 times in the poetic books. So if you know anything about the Old Testament, the Old Testament, according to the Hebrews, is divided up into three sections. The law, the Torah, which is the five first books. Then you have the prophets, and then you have the writings. The prophets we know to be Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, then the minor prophets. Uh, and then the, the writings are, of course, the poetic books. Psalms, Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes, Job. Some will include Ruth and Esther, but a lot of times Ruth and Esther 
and first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, even Joshua and Judges are included in what's often called the prophets. So but anyway, Sheol is used 35 times in the poetic books, only seven times in the Torah, and 19 times in the prophets. And this is why this whole topic is very difficult to, uh, to kind of grab hold of. When we talk about the end times, there's a couple of things that all Christians throughout history have basically agreed on. One is that there's going to be judgments at the end of the age that people will be judged. And so you can look all through scripture, talk about where there's going to be future judgments. Um, and there's a lot of debate as to is there just one judgment or are there different judgments? The other thing that people agree on is that Jesus will return, that he'll, he'll come back. Now, there's different beliefs as to what that actually means, but, but the return of Christ and then uh, the idea that uh, that there is um, okay, well, 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 that there is is like a a place after life here upon this earth. So there's there's agreement on on judgment and return of Christ, uh, a conscious place after death here on this earth, and then uh, the the fourth one is. Oh, I just it just went through my mind. Um, oh, yeah, that that there will be um, a resurrection of the dead. Okay, so those are things that that most most Christians throughout the ages have have at least agreed on. Now, as you get into the details of those things, that's where a lot of your disagreements come, and a lot of the reasons they're disagreements is because Scripture itself is not very clear on these things. And so th that has caused a lot of different speculation. So the fact that this word Sheol occurs mostly in the poetic books should tell us that there is not like a detailed, systematic explanation of Sheol in the Old Testament. It's used in poetic ways, and we know whenever it's you when words are used poetically, we're not always sure if they're meant to be literal or if they're meant to be a metaphor or a simile or just an illustration of some other thought. So that, that's why there's, there's a lot of differences on these things. So let's look at a couple of verses that talk about Sheol, 2 Samuel chapter 12. Go ahead. Okay, so this is the incident where David has committed um, adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba has this baby. This baby gets sick. While the baby is sick, David is fasting and praying. But then the baby dies. He stops fasting and praying. He seems to brighten up. And everyone says, what, what is wrong with you? Your baby's dead. And he said, well, you know, when the baby was alive, even though it was struggling, uh, there was the hope that maybe God could intervene. But now that he's dead, so notice here's what he said. And this is repeated in Scripture many times. He cannot come back. So, you know, you look, see a lot of movies and a lot of things about people that die and either their spirit comes back or something comes back. Or we even use terms like, yeah, I, you know, People who have lost loved ones, they'll say, yes, I still feel, feel my husband around me, you know, stuff like that. But, but the reality is that scripture seems to imply that once you're dead, you cannot come back to this earth. You don't come back to this earth. That's the implication from scripture, and we'll see that even in the New Testament. So that's what David says, is he cannot come back, but I will go to him. Now, what does that mean? Well, it could mean that David is saying he's in heaven and I'm going to go to heaven. Or probably what he meant is he's gone to the place of the dead. One day I'm going to die and I'll go to that same place. So Sheol was the intermediate state in which souls are dealt with according to their lives on earth. So it was the place where the dead went to. In the Old Testament, many scriptures imply that everyone who dies goes to Sheol. 
Other scripture seems to put more emphasis on the wicked and the unrighteous are the ones who go to Sheol. There's many scriptures that make Sheol seem like a very dark, drab, and um, you know, a place where there's torment and torture. So that's why there's, there's this difference as to is Sheol the place where everyone goes after they die, or is it just for the unrighteous dead? So another passage, Psalm 89, 48. Who's got that one? Okay, the power of the grave, the word grave there is Sheol. Who can escape the power of the grave? That verse seems to imply that everyone will go to Sheol. Job chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Okay, so again, it's the idea that once you go down to the grave, and again, the, the translation there uses grave, but it's, refer, it's the Hebrew word is sheol. And so it says when you go down to the grave, when you die, you cannot return. Okay, and then the last verse, Ecclesiastes 9.10. Okay, did, did you hear those words? There's no thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. No thought? Yeah, see? So now, again, we're going to see some passages with, that seem to uh, say something different than that. But I think what the emphasis they're saying is what we normally think of as, as uh, normal activities here upon this earth are not going to be the same in, after, the, after our death. So the Sheol is, is the place of the dead. Um, the G, go ahead. But isn't it eternal death, so there's still, like... Okay, yeah, we're, we're going to get into that, yeah. So, so Sheol uh, is the place where all, uh, you could say in, in the Old Testament, where all dead people go. Uh, four times in Genesis, it, it talks about that. It talks about all the people going to, to Sheol when they die. Um, it's also, as I mentioned before, the place where the wicked go. There are specific passages in Psalm 55, Job 24, that refer to that. It's also a place that the Old Testament refers to as where the righteous will be saved from. So now we're starting to get a hint that certain people who go down to Sheol will one day be taken out of there. Now, since there's already been verses that say they won't come back to this earth, they're going to be taken back to something else. So we're going to talk about that a little later. So Sheol is a place where the righteous can be saved from. David often talks about deliver my soul from the grave. He's not simply saying don't let me die physically. He's saying after I'm dead, please don't, keep, don't let me stay in, the, in Sheol. So there was, there's this thinking that Sheol was not the final place for people even after they die. So that's why we call it an intermediate state. Um, Sheol is the place over which God has complete sovereignty. So we often talk about death as separation from God. But there's plenty of verses that say even in hell, even in Sheol, even in Hades, God is there. You cannot get away from God when you really think about it. Now, what they talk about when they say, you know, you're separated from God is you're separated from his grace, his mercy. You're separated from his activity in your life, which implies that here upon this earth, even unbelievers experience the presence and the activity of God. They just are unaware of it or don't want to see it. But, but hell or separation from God is going to be eternal eventually. So... Sheol is that intermediate place. Um, in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, um, Sheol was often translated with the Greek word Hades. So you've heard about this term. Hades is, again, not hell. If you think of hell as the final destination of the unbelieving dead, then Hades, again, is just a temporary intermediate stage. So it's translated Hades. In the New Testament, Hades, uh, over ten times, is called a place of punishment. Um, and yet, 
Its power cannot withstand the church. Remember when Jesus said to Peter, he goes, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Uh, Peter, in his letter, implies, or not, not in his letter, actually in his, his address at the day of Pentecost, implies that Jesus rose from Hades. He quotes from Psalm chapter 16. And then finally in Revelation 20:14, it says that Hades, or Sheol, will be thrown into the lake of fire. So that's why we say Sheol, Hades, is a temporary intermediate state. So that's why this whole topic today is the intermediate state, what's going on there. So that's one thing that we find in the Old Testament is their belief in Sheol, this intermediate state, um, right after death. Go ahead. Yep, 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 we're going to get into that. Yeah. Okay, so the other th thing that's important to realize in the Old Testament is that they believed in resurrection. We've been influenced a lot by Greek philosophy and thought that tended to separate the body from the soul. A lot of the language would be your body is just in a sense, a prison that holds your soul. And that ultimate freedom is for your soul to be freed from your prison. And Jewish thought was not that way at all. The Jewish thought tended to keep the body and the soul together. So their, their emphasis after death was not so much, oh, you, you, you know, you're up in heaven somewhere, your soul is up there, your spirit's up there. Uh, no, for them it was the idea of the resurrection. The resurrection would occur, that your body, bodily resurrection, your body would be raised, it would be a new body, a different body, but your soul and your body were, were to be together. So, I've listed some of the passages there. Job talked about that in the end he, he would be raised. Isaiah talks about resurrection, and uh, I know you're going through Daniel right now, you're not quite at chapter 12. Hopefully you'll get there, um, but in J Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 is probably one of the most definite passages about resurrection. So those are the main two things when we think about what happens after death uh, to get from the Old Testament. They, be they believed in an intermediate state, a temporary intermediate state. When I say temporary, obviously it's lasted for thousands of years, or if you believe in an old earth, um, millions of years, whatever. Um, so don't think of temporary as a short time. Think of it as it doesn't last forever. And we know from Revelation that, that one day Hades will be thrown, Sheol will be thrown into the lake of fire and will be destroyed. Okay? So. What verse is that? What's that? What verse is that? Um, Revelation... Do I have it written down? 20, verse 14. It says, The lake of fire was meant for Satan and his demons, but all the people who are raised, whose names are not written in the book of life, will also be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. New Testament. Let's start with the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. Now, got to be very careful with this because we're not sure if this is a factual account of the intermediate state or is it a parable or what is it? Many believe that, that it was the customary belief of the Jewish people at this time that this is how they looked at what it was like when somebody died. And Jesus was using that same illustration as he gave this story. Now, even if this, these aren't uh, uh, definite facts, there's, I, there, I do believe there's a lot of things that, that relate to what is the truth about the intermediate state. So when we look at this, this story, it's, it tells us a lot of different things. So uh, turn to Luke chapter 16, uh, starting in verse 19. 
It says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat from uh, what fell from the rich man's table. Um, Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. Now the word there for hell is the Greek word Hades where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. King James Version, I kind of like, says the bosom of Abraham. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime You received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, even if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, you can pick apart this story with a lot of things. You could say, wow, sounds like they're emphasizing works. Sounds like that God, Jesus is condemning rich people and saying that poor people will automatically go into heaven. <laughs> uh, you, so you can, you can critique this, but yet, just like, like a lot of stories that Jesus told, you have to ask yourself, what is, what is Jesus trying to relate here? And I think the main thing he's trying to relate is what you see at the very end. When, when uh, the rich man says, oh, could you at least send somebody back from, back from the bosom of Abraham so that they could you know, be warned not to end up where I am? And of course, the, the answer was, well, they have the law and the prophets. They have scripture. And if they don't listen to scripture, how are they going to listen to somebody who's been raised from the dead? Now, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus then was raised from the dead. And so if you ever wonder, after you've talked to somebody, given them the gospel, or you shared them your faith story, and they just you know, kind of said, oh, that's just for you. This is not, you know, I don't believe in any of that. And you, you kind of wonder, why is that? Well. Uh, just because Jesus rose doesn't mean that people are going to accept him, which, which from our perspective seems pretty amazing. Um, but accepting Jesus, in a sense, as Savior goes hand in hand with accepting the word of God that he's given to us. Through the, to, the, to these people, it was, the, it was the law and the prophets. To us, it's the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, as well as now the New Testament. So that, that to me is the main thing that Jesus is giving, that, that we need to be, be sure that we listen to the word of God now. Otherwise, we had, could have suffered dire consequences if we don't listen and obey. So that, that to me is the main lesson that Jesus is giving here. But he tells it in a way that makes us wonder about if these are the elements that these people believed as far as what the afterlife was, the intermediate stage, then there's some things we could learn here. This is where we get the idea that Sheol may have had two compartments. So that's one theory, that Sheol had two compartments. And so the two compartments were, as from this parable, um, you have um, this word Hades becomes one of, the, one of the compartments. And then you have the word, the bosom of Abraham. Or some equate that with paradise. Oh. Can you think of another time where paradise is used in the Bible? The yeah, thief on the cross. Remember, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Was he saying, today you will be with me in that compartment of Sheol? I don't know. I don't think so. But... Um, 
uh, that's what some believe. So the, the belief is that there was, the, that Sheol had two compartments. One compartment, so that Sheol was the place where all dead people go, but those who were, had faith in what God had told them would go to the bosom of Abraham. He, they would go to the place of peace and comfort, obviously being with Abraham connotes the idea of comfort. Yeah, here was this, this uh, poor man who had suffered all his life, but now he seemed to be in peace. The other compartment was, um, was Hades, or the other term used in the New Testament is Gehenna, which actually is a reference to uh, the garbage dump that was outside of Jerusalem. <laughs> and the reason it was a garbage dump was many believe that before uh, the Israelites took over Jerusalem, that's where the pagan tribes would make their human sacrifices. So that's why it became a garbage dump. There was like a fire there all the time and burning up stuff. So that's where you, they get those images of hell and of Hades and of Gehenna uh, being this eternal fire of, of torment and torture. So the, the two compartment theory of Sheol, the, one of the views then goes on to say that when Jesus died and rose from the dead, he went down to Sheol and he either preached the gospel or he proclaimed his death and resurrection, and he then delivered all the ones in the bosom of Abraham, took them up with him into paradise, or what we consider heaven today. Okay, what's that? Okay, many believe this happened um, between Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. So, for instance, in Peter, he talks about Jesus going down and preaching to the ones in prison. But see, that, that's still very vague, and there's a lot of different interpretations there. But that's one of the interpretations. Uh, Ephesians talks about that when Jesus rose, before he could even rise, before he ascended, uh, Paul says, he descended and he led forth captivity. So those were the ones who were in Sheol, and they've now been delivered. Remember I said in the Old Testament, it said that the righteous would eventually be delivered from Sheol. Well, that's what happened to them. So the idea is that there is a two compartment of Sheol, but after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's, there isn't that. So that when people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, when they die, they don't go to Sheol now. And, and Paul is very clear that when we die, when believers die, when Christians die, they go into the presence of Jesus. So then you have to ask yourself, well, where's the presence of Jesus right now? We, we talk about the presence of Jesus with us all the time. But no, we're talking about the, where Jesus, the God-man, who has a body, where is he? Okay, we know he's at the right hand of God, and we call that heaven. And then we also know from Revelation, there's this one chapter that talks about heaven coming down to the earth. And so there's, you know, but, but the old, most Christians, uh, or at least many Christians for the longest time, used to put a lot of emphasis on heaven being that place where God is. It's separated from this earth. But a lot of people now say, oh, no, 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 God's going to restore this earth to its original creation which is at Eden, that's when heaven comes down to this earth and they, they will then say, and we're going to be on this earth for the rest of our lives, for, for eternity. So that, that's kind of the, the thought that a lot of people think today because many believe that, have you ever heard the phrase, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good? People thought so much about heaven, they thought about, oh, I just can't wait till I escape from this earth and get to heaven. The idea that this earth is a terrible place, let's get out of here. But then others say, no, 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 we can't do that because if you want to escape the earth, that means you're not going to do anything to help people here on this earth. You're not going to do anything to take care of the 
uh, animals of this earth, the climate changes and all that you don't care about, which there may be some people like that, but all the Christians I've known that have always believed in heaven were not like that. And I have a feeling most of you are not like that, even though certain aspects of this you may not totally agree with. But very few of us go out and just litter in the world, right? We don't just consume things just because we want to consume them. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> well, somebody cleaned it up. So, see? But anyway, the whole, the whole point I'm making is that that was one theory is that there was this two-compartment view of Sheol, but now there's only one compartment. So, remember, though, we get that from this story <laughs> more than anything else. And this idea of the two-compartment theory was actually a Jewish theory that started coming up during the period between the Old and the New Testament. And that's why Jesus used that. Whether it was the actual case or not, we don't, we don't know that. Okay, question, comment? So is it like, like Aden and Earth and then like Abraham's bosom? Because it said that uh, if somebody rises from the dead, then you know my brothers can believe. Like rises from the dead to go back to where his brothers are, to the Earth. But then it says that Lazarus was carried up to heaven, or like carried up to Abraham's bosom, right? So it's like this... <coughs> Well, yeah, that's how a lot of people look at it. That's why they, we often talk about hell being down there and heaven being up there. And a lot of that was also affected by uh, Dante and his Inferno and Paradiso and all of his writings. We, we get much more, uh, or a lot of our views of heaven and hell, more from that than actually scripture. And, and um, so... Uh, Contra or the other view is that, that Sheol is not a two-compartment place, that even in this story, it doesn't necessarily show two compartments. Notice what it says, that, that the rich man could observe Lazarus and Abraham, but they were a long way off. Uh, usually when you think of two compartments, they're kind of close by. It's kind of like the, the bedroom's on this side and the bedroom's on this side. This is, this is Hades and this is the bosom of Abraham, you know. But, 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 but the, idea that, the idea that they were a long way off implies that maybe there was not a connection. But there seems to be, at least for this story, the idea that they could see each other. But you'll also notice it says that, you know, the, the rich man said, oh, could Lazarus just dip his finger in water so I could have just a little a drop of water? And he says, no, no one can cross over from your side to this side. No one from this side can go to that side. So those are some things that we need to keep in mind when we think about that intermediate state. Now, another passage that talks about, uh, that, that a lot of people use to, to talk about the intermediate state is John chapter 14. This is the one that's often used at funerals. I've used it at funerals tons of times. That's the one where he says, let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God, trust in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. If I, go, if I prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. But that's not talking about the intermediate state. That's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? So even though we use this at funerals, we should then say, one of these days, Jesus will come again for all of us. It's not every time you die, Jesus comes and gets you and takes you to heaven. That's not what John 14 is all about. So even though we often use that to think of, this is what happens when I die, it's, it's really talking about when Jesus returns. So right now, Jesus, we, I asked the question before, where is Jesus now? Well, wherever he is, he's building a place for us. Okay? So that's what we need to remember and think about. So, John, go ahead. You just said that we should. I understand that this is, this is not yet, but there is a place that we go to. Yes, God. we're getting to that right now. Okay, so here's some insights from Paul. Um, I, I'm running out of time, so we'll skip on judgment. I, I think most of you understand there's a lot of verses that talk about judgment. Um, there's been, I believe there's different kinds of judgment. Um, 
The final judgment, of course, is the great white throne judgment. That's when people, Satan and the demons, will be thrown into the lake of fire. But there's also a judgment of Christian works, which I believe is different than the great, great white throne judgment. At the great white throne judgment, I believe no Christians are going to be judged. We've already been judged. We're already with the Lord. That's my, my belief. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is primarily a chapter on resurrection. And so it does give us ideas as to what happens at death because uh, Paul uses this to... Um, now, this is really interesting because he, he, he tries to... He justifies the resurrection of Jesus by saying we all believe in the bodily resurrection of people. If there is no bodily resurrection, then Jesus did not rise from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then your faith is vain. You would think he would go the other way, that, oh, because Jesus rose from the dead, there, we all believe in bodily resurrection. Well, no, the Jews believed in bodily resurrection before that. So what he's saying is we all believe in bodily resurrection. Therefore, we should be able to accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because we accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he brings us new life. It shows that he's conquered death. So those are the, th the words of comfort that we, we get. And in, in verses 20 through 26, it talks about an order of resurrection. Jesus Christ is the first who rose from the dead. Broadly speaking, at Christ's second coming is when believers will be resurrected. And then at the great white throne judgment, all the unsaved dead will be resurrected. So resurrection is not just a promise to believers. Resurrection is for everybody. But you're resurrected either to eternal life or you're resurrected to eternal death. Question. Yes. So, <laughs> when we die, yes. the body goes in the ground and our spirit goes to Hades. Yep, we're going to get to that. Not we're going to get to that. <laughs> Okay, let me, let me, we'll get to that. We didn't admit it. So, um, other passages from Paul to look up is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This to me is talking about the intermediate state. He talks about when we die, our tent, he calls our body, our physical body, a tent. He says our tent is destroyed and we groan because we are unclothed. In other words, he seems to say that when we die, our soul is separated from our physical bodies. He calls that we're unclothed, but we're groaning in order to be clothed. But then he does talk about being clothed with a heavenly tent, a heavenly structure. Now, I believe, well, I'll get to that at the very end, my final conclusion. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the third heaven. I remember Paul says, I was, I was having these issues, and all of a sudden, uh, I don't know if it was a dream. You guys were talking about dreams earlier. He says, I don't know if it was a dream. I don't know if it was a vision. I don't know what it was, but I was transported into the third heaven. So what they say is the third heaven is our, the sky is the first heaven. Outer space is the second heaven, and heaven Eternal heaven is the third heaven. So this is where we get that idea of the tiered idea. But, but you know, I, I like to think that heaven, where God is, is not a physical place. It's a real place, but it's not a physical place. You can't go and find it. It's like, you probably don't remember this because you never, you weren't born at this time. When they first started the sending people up into space, the Russian guy that was sent up, he goes, ha, I'm up in space and I don't see God. <laughs> and of course, every Christian goes, well, duh, that's not how you see God. You know, you just showed your ignorance and your antagonism toward God. Um, but that's how a lot of people think. They think, well, you know, I can't wait to get to heaven as if this were a physical place we go to. It is a real place, but it's not physical. And that, of course, is hard for us to conceive of because we're so tied to spirit and body and because of the resurrection we will have a body but it's not going to be a physical body first corinthians 15 says that 
flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So whatever body we have is not going to be a flesh and blood body. It'll be kind of like, I believe it's going to be a body like Jesus had when he rose from the dead. He could come, he could eat, he could be touched, but he could also disappear whenever he wanted to. He could appear whenever he wanted to. He could, you know, pass through doors, it even said. How could we not be flesh and blood if we're eating and drinking and doing things that we do on earth? Well, do you believe God can do anything? Well, so God can cause us to touch something, but it doesn't necessarily have to be earthly physical. Where's that verse? Where's what verse? That you, that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yeah, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so... Um, Yes, yes, we will. I'm, I'm getting there. For, okay, one other passage, Philippians 1, 21 through 26. This is where Paul says to die is to gain. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he, that's where he talks about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there's our, our hope that when we die, we will be in the presence of the Lord. Now, where that is and what we will be like we don't have the complete answers to that. What we do know is we will be in the presence of the Lord. So we could take comfort in that. So Hebrews chapter 9, James 2 also are some passages about the intermediate stage. Okay, so here's the conclusions. So what happens between death and resurrection? Uh, there's not much in the New Testament that really says, talks about this. I believe one of the reasons is because the early Christians believed that Jesus was going to return any minute. So they're thinking, why do we need to talk about the intermediate state? Because Jesus is going to return. We're all going to be resurrected. We're all going to be in the kingdom of God. But there's also an emphasis on, the, on human wholeness. It's the idea that, that as we're only whole when we're body and soul, when we're both body and immaterial part. Remember when we talked about the soul, the spirit, conscience, all those different things? We're, we're a whole and so, but the, but the body changes, obviously. When we die, all you got to do is go to some cemetery here, and if they'll let you, you could dig up a grave. What are you going to find? Well, the older it is, you you'll just may find some bones. But even bones can deteriorate eventually. So the body, our physical body, just kind of deteriorates. And that's what Paul talked about. So here are some different choices. A. Your soul and body dies, and at the resurrection, both of, you, both of them are raised. Some people actually believe that, that when we die, total unconsciousness until the resurrection. Almost like soul sleep, which we'll talk about too. B, purgatory. If you come from a Catholic background, that was the idea. You die, you went to purgatory to kind of burn off all the sins <laughs> that, you, that you didn't take care of here upon this earth. Of course, that was one of the issues that caused the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther said, you can't do this because what that they were doing was if you pay money, then your loved ones will not spend as, as long a time in purgatory. So some believe the intermediate state is actually a time where we're, we're kind of purified for heaven, totally purified. But that, there's nothing in scripture that says that. C, soul and spirit are separated from the body and is right away with Jesus. Many believe that we are in a, just our souls and our spirits are going to be with Jesus. In other words, we don't have a body at that time. But again, I believe this scripture says too much about to not have a body just doesn't seem to make sense. So that brings us to number D, or letter D, temporary heavenly body with Jesus. So in other words, you die, you are in the presence of Jesus Christ, you have a temporary human a temporary body until the resurrection when you get your resurrected body Sec, or second corinthians chapter 5 may hint at that when he talks about when we die our earthly tent is demolished we groan wanting to be clothed and then we are clothed with a heavenly body but he doesn't really talk about the final resurrection there and so i believe he's talking about a temporary body 
So you can see where I kind of lean here. I believe that there, if, if we look at it that way. So that's one way to look at it. Um, e, soul sleep. And this is not a, I do not believe this is a biblical doctrine, but there are some Christian groups that believe this. Some believe that Martin Luther believed this, that when you died, your soul slept. In other words, there was, you had no consciousness until the resurrection. When you were resurrected, you woke up. So essentially what would happen is you would die. The next thing you would realize, recognize, be conscious of is in your resurrected body in the presence of Jesus. That's what soul sleep is really all about. Okay? It's, it's not just your soul literally sleeps. It's you have no consciousness until the next thing you have consciousness of is you're resurrected. So that brings me to the F. <laughs> You'll notice time travel. And what I mean by this is when you die, when we die, when Christians die, this is just for Christians, when Christians die, they're out of time. They're in eternity. And so in a sense, the resurrection has occurred. So in another sense, after you die, the next conscious thing you have is you're in the presence of God with your resurrected body. See, when you think about it, the resurrection occurs in time. If God is outside of time, the resurrection has already occurred. All things have already occurred to God. If, if, you, if you are that strict on, on dividing, in a sense, time here upon this earth with time in heaven. So, all right. If you want, you can leave because I've gone five minutes over. But if you have some questions or comments, you can hang around and ask me or argue with me or say, what a bunch of hogwash that is. So, so where do I stand? I, I believe, first of all, that we have a temporary body or else I, I like the idea of you're instantly at the, body, at the resurrection of, G, of, of humanity. All right? Does that help any? Or does, are you just, all right? I don't know what to think now. <laughs> well, good, good. <laughs>